generative art or the process of using computers, computational machinery to create art is something that has been deeply interesting to me and also an area that has been growing in uh, the number of followers and the number of people interested in this entire space. Now, this is not an entirely new area, but obviously it necessarily came about only after computers became popular enough for people, artists, to have access to them. So starting in the 60s and 70s, there was a movement by a small number of programmers and artists to use computers to create patterns, to create geometric shapes, and to create things that we would call art. Now, this is not just in terms of images, but also in terms of sound, the entire multimedia experience as art, and using computers to create that. Now, in 1977, one of the most popular computing magazines of the day, Byte magazine, published an article by two gentlemen, Anderson and Galway, which focused on an algorithm called serendipitous circles. The idea that you could take a simple graph uh, construction algorithm where each subsequent point would be an input to the next iteration of identifying where the next point would be plotted and use that in a very simple way with different equations to create these amazing shapes on screen. And the shapes would be circles, uh, ovals, um, lines, uh, stars, things where particles interact in ways that create shapes in the mind of the observer. And in those days, in the late 70s, the displays that these folks used were pretty simplistic displays. They were monochrome, there was, there was even some work to, to create these images on oscilloscope displays. But of course, things have advanced quite significantly since those days. Now, I'm an avid reader of a computing history and uh, I enjoy my Byte magazine collection. Last year, I chanced upon this particular article and I wanted to recreate that algorithm, the serendipitous circles algorithm, for the modern era. So I implemented that algorithm in P5 processing, uh, P5.js, which is uh, an infrastructure, a language, a library for JavaScript that allows you to create art and artistic expressions using code. It's actually a very popular language that's used by many artists. Uh, both to create sound and images and motion and all, all of these different things and even control physical aspects of art in the real world. So, for example, motor control and light control where you can do these multimedia uh, exhibits. So I implemented this algorithm in p5.js and I provided a version of it online for free. And then I became so enthralled with what I was seeing coming out of that algorithm. I made a few modifications. I adapted it for color. I adapted and brought in several other qualities, for example, transparency and being able to play around with the, the size and the shape of pixels and how they interact with each other and lines that might connect them. And with all of this uh, addition, the colors and shapes and pictures that this algorithm was generating were amazing to me. Now, I've been in generative art and I've been interested in that field for a long time. I remember uh, even in the early days of my programming career uh, as a kid when I was programming in BASIC, I remember being able to create lines on screen in certain orders that created on CRTs or uh, cathode ray tube uh, displays, created interactions between those lines. And, and there were shapes that came out of what's called the moire effect. Uh, where these lines interact with each other. And you're not really plotting that shape. So you might be plotting lines, for example, but the way they fall on the screen, you start to see ovals and other uh, intermediate shapes, which has to do with how the display draws the image. It has to do with the, the distance between pixels. It has to do with the glow of the tube. The specifics, the mechanics of the display create these interactions which make computer art uh, really special. And if you think about it in those terms, the exciting thing about computer art, generative art, 
is that part of it is the excitement of an algorithm producing something that looks so interesting. The other part is the instrumentation, the tools, the medium used to render and run that algorithm and produce it in a visible way. And when you change that, when, when you change that set of tools and you change that equipment, what you see becomes different. Art on a CRT is different from art on an LCD, is different from art on a projector, is different from art on um, an M by N matrix of LEDs that are being controlled by a computer. And so all of these limitations of the tool, of the canvas, of the medium, and their many interactions with the algorithms being used to produce this art change the outcome tremendously. So to me, this is deeply interesting because the way things are calculated, well, that depends on the kind of processor you're using. It depends on the kind of accuracy of floating point numbers the processor might use. And depending on how accurately you calculate things, you might round certain things out and plot a pixel in the end at a certain point. With less accuracy, you might plot with the same equation as the input, that pixel at a different point. Then once you plot the pixel, it might be large and it might glow because you're doing it on a low resolution CRT, or it might be very, very small with minimal glow because you might be doing it on a very high resolution LCD display. So all of this and the many interactions between this make computer art, generative art to me very, very special. Now, coming back to uh, this specific algorithm uh, with serendipitous circles and my adaptations of it, I'll put links in the description below as to how you can go and visit this website that I've put together and generate your own art based on uh, this algorithm. But I also published a book about it. And uh, that book is also linked in this description below. And it shows you many examples of art that came out of this program. Now, as I've spent more time with this really simple algorithm, I've gotten even more enamored with the words that seem to materialize out of this algorithm. And one of the things that I think about now is, well, this is two-dimensional. How can you make this three-dimensional? And what we look upon when we see, you know, these universe-like, uh, filament-like architectures that emerge from this algorithm, we see that as a 2D projection. But how can this algorithm be modified to add some body, to add some Z dimension to all of these images and to make it a three-dimensional sculpture uh, that emerges from these uh, from these algorithms, and in particular serendipitous circles. I've also played around with taking the two-dimensional projections of these algorithms and now taking the 3D printing technology and being able to use these pictures to create uh, embossed versions or impressions, three-dimensional impressions of this shape, of this two-dimensional projection onto a physical surface. What you can do with that particularly with the advent of inexpensive 3D printing technology, is just amazing. So all of this is to say that I invite you to enjoy and to explore this world of generative art. I'll put some resources down in the description below, and I would invite you to use these tools to think about how this is a new form of art and what you might do to create works, expressions, sculptures, images that advance the state of the art, both from a science perspective, from an algorithmic perspective, from the use of technology, and also in the beauty that all of this produces.